God's mighty men and women. Mighty men and women. Uh, in fact, I actually gave this a title. How to make the king's honor roll. Back in the 80s, and Paul, you'll remember this. Back in the 80s, this text was preached on many times. And I uh, was tr- uh, really mightily blessed and moved by the things. And, it's, and see, for me, when I hear something that connects me with something of a supernatural outlook or, or a hope-filled outlook, I never forget it. I, I don't have an identic mind. I'm just lucky to have a mind. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I remember the things <clears throat> that I had learned in the past. And this, this portion of Scripture came back to me so powerfully. And so I'm going to read it, and then we're going to uh, unpack it a little bit here before we go. We're talking about how to be mighty in God and what are those traits of the people who make the honor roll of God's mighty men. And this is about the mighty men that served with David. And I have a whole lot to say about when David, how David became the leader of mighty men, men that were, had a miserable in debt. They were discouraged. They were disillusioned. They were, uh, you know, just kind of cast away. Their vision, their desires were all shot through the things they were experiencing. And the Bible says they gathered themselves unto David. And I'll get into this another time, but they first gathered 400 with David in, but two chapters later, a chapter and a half later, it says that David's mighty men gathered together, and now there's 600. <laughs> That's pretty good leadership. <clears throat> to start with nothing, and the guys you got that come in, they were in debt, and they were, dis- they were not happy. <clears throat> and suddenly, now they're part of an army that David's raising up, and they begin to grow and be mighty in God and mighty in their uh, in their work. So these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshua, Joshua, that's Second Samuel chapter twenty-three, verse eight. This guy Joshua Basheshbeth, the Tacnamite. I get extra points for all those words. He was chief, the captain of all those that were David's mighty men. There was Adino, the Eznite, because he had killed 800 men at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo. He doesn't sound too smart. But it's actually pronounced Dodai. <laughs> he was an Eoite. And of the three mighty men with David, when they defied, and these three men were with David, when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel had retreated. Now, we know about Adino, who is the one who with the spear. By the way, his name, Adino, his nickname was the spear. <laughs> I guess if you saw someone kill 800 people at one time with a spear, you'd give him a nickname, too. Here he comes, the spear, the, the sharp one, you know. That's literally what his name means. But then after him was Eleazar, Eleazar the Ahite, and he was one of those. And when they had defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, the men of Israel had retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to plunder. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herorite. And the Philistines had gathered together in a troop, and where was a piece of ground full of lentils. One translation says that this was an inher- a, a, a field that was an inheritance of some people in the city. And the Philistines gathered together to take it. It was just a piece of ground full of, some say beans, some say barley. So the people fled from the Philistines. But Shammah stationed himself in the middle of the field and defended it and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. I'm going to stop right there and just kind of unpack this in a way. I always love one of my experiences as a, uh, I always tell this story because it's fun to pick on my sister. When you think about, here's David and his, they're defying, they're defying the armies of the Philistines. And while they're doing that, all the Israel army took off. So there they are standing all alone. It reminded me of the time that my brother, was Steve, was coming home from school after football practice. This was up in Hardin, Montana. And a bunch of ruffians kind of gathered around him and were picking on him and trying to start a fight. 
and my sister was walking home with them and they were just going after Steve with all kinds of threats and cussing at him, all that stuff. And so finally, you know, if you think you're that bad, just come on, just, we'll show you. And all of a sudden she turned around and Steve's gone. <laughs> there she stands, Eliezer, all alone. <laughs> I always laugh at that story because it's so like how family will operate, you know. You can, I can say whatever I want to pick on my family, but if you do, you better be careful. How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know, I, I, can, I, can, I can comment on what shortcomings my family is, but if you get in that, you are going to be in trouble. <clears throat> when we talk about God's mighty men, we have to remember something. They're mighty for a reason. It's not because they're, that we, how would we compare to those? I mean, I've never killed even 800 spiders at one time. I, you know, we, how do you compare yourself to mighty men? Well, this th- is a little statement, and I, I don't remember where I, I know it came off of page 62 of something I read. So I can't tell you for sure who the author was. I didn't have time to find it. But it says, true spiritual power does not flow through powerful people, but through only, or only through surrendered people. Our power is based on our total and complete surrender to the Lord Jesus. Psalm 110 verse 3 says, Your people will be willing warriors when you go to war and into battle. They will be arrayed in holy garments and your strength will be renewed each day in them like the dew of the morning. From the womb of the tomb you will have the newness of resurrected life. Because of what Jesus did, because of what Jesus did when he conquered Death, hell, and the grave, and rose again. He empowered his church to be a mighty army that he leads. And it says this, that when God begins to demonstrate his awesome power, people will be willing to step into the battle. And wouldn't you believe that's the thing you do, is that when you see that the one that's leading you is powerful, and that our Lord Jesus has got the victory for us, that we would line up and say, we'll fight with you. We'll ride with you. There was a song during the uh, revival in the 90s that says, that said, Lord, uh, we will ride with you. He's got fire in his eyes. You remember the song? Yeah. We will ride with you. Well, David had these mighty men that followed him. And part of the reason they did was the kind of man that David was. David was the kind of guy that, that served selflessly. In fact, at one point, uh, David was, they were in a, a, a holdup getting ready to fight with the Philistines. And David was desperately thirsty. And he said, oh, that I could just get a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. Oh, I just thirst for that. And his men heard it. And they broke into the stronghold or the, the, uh, uh, the, the stronghold of the Philistines that were in Bethlehem. And they got water and took it to David. They took it and brought it to David. And when David got it and he looked at it, he said, this is, I can't drink this because this is the blood of men who laid down their life for me. And he poured it out to the Lord. Now that's leadership. That's someone who says, I, I understand the sacrifice people make and I would not dare drink this. I'll pour it out to the one who's worthy. Oh, help me somebody who's worthy of our service, our praise, who's worthy of our absolute devotion. It's our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So this morning, my desire, my purpose is to convey the need for this generation, all of us, young and old alike, to have such an intimate relationship with God that we understand the strength that he's given us to do great things for God. He's called us to do great things. John 14 says, if you believe in me, greater things than these shall you do because I go to the Father. And I tell you, sometimes we need to just do the things Jesus did before we attempt to do greater things. But he said you would do greater things. You believe that? And I'll unpack a little bit of here in a moment about Eliezer and those guys and what they did. This last day revival spoken of by the prophet Joel says that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh and they will do great things, prophesy and so on. Even the weak will become strong by faith. And we find that in Hebrews 11. I don't have time to go there, but the whole chapter is about by faith, by faith, by faith. These followers of the Lord did great things and God used them to do things that were impossible. Impossible things were done because of their faith in the Lord. I always love to remember Samson, who 
whenever the, he, Samson was, by the way, wasn't a perfect guy. He was a mess. But he nevertheless was a deliverer God called. But it says one day, one day he was uh, heading home and a lion jumped out at him. And the Bible says, the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he grabbed him and rent him like a little kid. And I don't mean a child. I mean like a small animal. <laughs> little goat. The spirit of the Lord came upon him and he had supernatural strength. We also know at another time when the Philistines were so angry at what Samson had done that the the people of Judah came to Samson and said, listen, you're causing so much trouble and we're going to have to tie you up and give you over to the Philistines. And, And Samson said, that's fine. As long as you promise me you won't kill me once you tie me up. So they tied him up in fresh new cords that would be very difficult to break. I don't know why the men of Judah were so dumb. <clears throat> so they brought him to the Philistines to hand him over and say, here, now we, we're giving you the guy that's causing you trouble, now leave us alone. Well, that's not how the enemy works. There is no detente with the devil. You can't make a, you can't make a deal with the devil. We've learned that in the headlines recently, haven't we? So, <clears throat> When the Philistines saw that the, Ju- the men of Judah had brought him and bound up, they, they shouted with triumph, oh, we got Samson. And Samson jumped up and the Bible says again, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he broke those cords like they were uh, made of flax exposed to the flame. In other words, they just were singed off and he took the battle. And you know what? This is a funny story. It says that he, after that happened, he reached down and noticed a freshly killed donkey. And he took the jawbone of that donkey and he, he fought against, uh, you, you never have an excuse for not being used of God. Because if God can do, use a jawbone of an ass, he can use you. I didn't swear, folks. So you all looking around going, did he say jawbone? Or? No, listen. In fact, I remember one time Dr. Gary Musgrove, who was pastor at Angel's Temple, told this story one time about how our president at the time of the Foursquare Movement was so, he was speaking at an international convention. He was so inspired that he, he brought an illustrated sermon with him. And it, in a bag next to him was the jawbone of a donkey. And at one really important point in the message, he was trying to make the point about Samson slaying the, the Philistines. He reached out and op- put that bag open and he grabbed this jawbone out and said, Listen, Samson, kill the Philistines with a jaw and ass bone. Now, if you're, too, if you're too religious to laugh at that, then I can, I'm in trouble. So. But remember this guy. <laughs> oh, I love that story. <laughs> remember that God has his mighty men and women. Daniel faced the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they faced the fiery furnace. And Esther faced the wicked Haman. And by faith made a difference. The lesson of greatness is not the great feat that was done by David's mighty men. It was the love and commitment of these men throughout biblical history, not just men, but women as well, who loved their Lord so much that they served at the very cost of their life, if need be. So Adino is this guy that's pretty independent and he goes to battle. We don't know much more about that. In, uh, what else is there to say? I would have loved to have seen that. Watch, you know, watch a Jackie Chan movie and you can see you know, how you can beat up in a lot of people with a lot of great moves and everything. But this actually happened. I believe the Bible. I believe this actually happened. That one time he slew 800 people with uh, 800 warriors with a spear. He used what he had to fight because he loved the king he served. And what we're talking about is the kind of love and commitment to Christ that serves and has no, well, as, a, as Revelation says, they love not their lives unto the death, willing to die. Adino, the spear, was fearless. He strong, was strong in faith, fervent in his love, a, saw, a strong sense of duty and responsibility. And he did not care about the odds that were against him. What are the odds? 800 to 1? And you know what? Right now, we can, we, we can be all 
concerned about the odds that are against our whole globe, the COVID, the wars and rumors of wars and storms and disasters happening everywhere, fires on the East Coast and storms on the West Coast and storms on the East Coast and storms in the ocean and disasters everywhere. Well, the odds are against us. So, uh, you know, I, I almost know that there's times, I, I know there's times that Christians say, well, I, is it even worth praying? Folks, if we don't pray, we don't have a, this is dumb. We don't have a prayer if we don't pray. <laughs> uh, we just want too many things sir. you know. <laughs> When you have a love for Christ and you are so united with him, you don't care about the odds that are against you. By the way, Joshua 23 verses 8 through 11 says, when you love the Lord with all your heart, one shall put a thousand to flight. You see, we don't even understand the measure of God's grace that we have. We keep thinking of ourselves as this weak little group of people just kind of hoping that we can make it through till Jesus comes. Well, the church will be triumphant up until the day Jesus comes and we will join him in the heavens as a mighty victorious army. That is the promise of scripture. And it's too easy for us to give up on what's happening right now and say, well, it's never going to change. Listen, listen, folks, whoever has the most hope wins. And the Bible says, he that has hope will not be ashamed. And I want to encourage every one of us to continue to have hope. Because we love a king. We serve a king who gave his life for us. And that he has empowered us with his grace and with his love. And you see, when he loved us first, he gave us the power. He gave us the power to step up and be all that we're supposed to be. So this is the important things about these men. They loved the Lord with all their heart. They demonstrated the kind of love that perseveres in the face of overwhelming odds, overwhelming fatigue, and the value of what seems to be, in the world's eyes, an in, in, insignificant small thing. Love that fights valiantly for what we believe in. So we know about Eliezer, I mean, Adino, rather, the East Knight. Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahoite, he was left alone when, when they, and by the way, if you're going to taunt the devil, you better know what you're doing. They taunted the Philistines, and when everybody left, he could have left with them, but instead, his love for his king, he stood, he arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and stuck to the sword. I want you to think for a moment about what that means. I've already said, Edeno faced odds that were against him. 800 to 1 are not good odds if you want to win. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, if God be for us, who can be against us? 1 John 4, 4 says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. By the way, these guys operated in a lesser covenant than we have today. And yet God used them in a marvelous way. I love that scripture, by the way, where it talks about in Joshua. In fact, the verse 11 says, just remember this. Always love the the Lord your God with all your heart. Otherwise, you will end up losing out in the battle. It's the love for the Lord that keeps us moving. You know, if it was just an emotional thing, if it was just some little hopeful uh, religious experience, it'd be one thing. But folks, to have a dynamic relationship with God that is so great that you see the whole picture of what it means to be one who serves the Lord and how important it is that we please the King. Are you still here this morning? When the odds are greater... The Bible says no weapon formed against you will prosper. Eliezer represents the love that perseveres against obstacles of weakness and fatigue. And the principle there is the principle of persevering. How many know what perseverance means? Yeah, yeah. Perseverance has to do with going through stuff very severe, things that are very severe. I I don't know how we ended up with this idea that being a Christian would be easy. That somehow it was going to be just a walk in the park. 
Now, I believe that God gave us heaven to go to heaven in, but I also believe that we're going to face those things that will challenge our faith. And the nice thing about that is the promise is that but as a result of our faith being exercised, our faith grows. Or we can cast our side, a faith aside and we come, become what Paul, the apostle said to Timothy, some abandoning their faith became shipwrecked. Their lives lost purpose and things went away. But even in the midst, and here, here's what I want you to look. Look, God's looking for people to step up today and say, even though everything I listen to, everything I see on TV, everything I see on, on the videos that are out there, and I'm talking about music video, videos and the things that portray a particular philosophy of hedonism and sexuality and all those things, that someone takes a stand and says, you know what? This is, the, this is the greatness of the influence of that particular part of our culture. But I don't care how bad it is. I'm going to stand as a person who will live for God wholly and not be seduced by the generation. The odds are against you. You're not going to have people stand up and applaud your good work. Look at some of the guys who have stepped up in the, mid- in the middle of this uh, uh, tumultuous, violent time that we're, that we're in. And there's been Christian evangelists and, and uh, people that have stood up to preach in the midst of the most difficult, violent places. And instead of getting the applause of the believer, they not only faced those who said, what are they doing? They're just trying to be a sideshow. And then the world comes along and says, what do you think you're doing? Going out here and putting on this show. But yet I think about Sean Foyt and others who, as a result of what they did, people are getting saved and healed and delivered. People are coming to know the Lord. Can you say amen and praise the Lord for that? That even in the midst of a time when everybody says, shut up, shut down, there's someone who steps up and says, listen, the odds may be against me, but I'm not looking for the applause of men. I'm looking for the approval of the king I love and the one who died for me. Eliezer does not quit, though he stands alone. Imagine this. One of the hardest things as a leader is that sometimes those that you're leading aren't always there when you need them. Now, if anybody's going on vacation, don't bug me. I'm not talking about you. So, because I don't want anybody thinking that when I say, you know, that is all of a sudden you don't have the people that you needed there. Don't think I'm talking about you. I'm talking about the fact that when we're in the, in the heat of the battle, when everybody is there and they are equipped to fight, but they turn back in the day of battle because they forgot the testimony of the Lord. And this is what happened to Eliezer. He's ready to fight and he looks around. Everybody's gone. He's left alone. He could have said, wait up. <laughs> But he doesn't. He stays there and he fights. Holding on to the sword, he fights. And he beats the enemy. And even in the midst of fatigue and weariness and feeling abandoned, looking around, where's my help? His help came from the Lord. His help came from his love for the king. And he fought. And the Bible says the Lord granted a great victory that day. Now, what's interesting is that verse 10, it says that after Eliezer fought like he did, and he beat the enemy, and they were laying all over the field dead, the people who left ran back in the Bible. King James says, and they, they flew upon the spoils. That doesn't mean they flew. It means they jumped on the opportunity. Listen, Here's a group of people who are afraid to face the the live enemy, but they got boldness to strip a dead one. God doesn't care how. So you you messed up. You know what? The Lord says, listen, someone's going to pay the price. And I always think about that Jesus paid the price so that we could walk in and have the victory. He paid the price. Maybe sometimes you feel you can't face your enemy. It's too much. Face him by faith and under the power of the Lord. And listen, those who see your faith and your demonstrated perseverance will one day say, I may have ran when the enemy was here, but now that he's dead, I'm going to go in and strip him of all the the bounty because after all, the Lord won the victory. 
victory that day. You see, that's the key thing about this, is the Lord brought a victory. People to face, but they know how to strip. And the last one is Shama. Shama. He represents the one who fights for a small or insignificant and even humble circumstance. A group of Philistines come and they gather around a little field full of barley or beans, whatever you want to call it. And they're big enough to say, hey, we're taking this. Now, the villagers who, that was their inheritance, they run because their, one translation says the army left, but either way, the army left or the people left because they had no defense. But this guy, Shama, looks at him and says, hey, you know, you can pick on someone your own size. You may have run these guys, guys off thinking you can take what God has given them in their inheritance, but I'm one who will stand here and fight because this that you're taking does not belong to you. It belongs to the people of God. Yes. Help me, somebody. Yes. Shama says, I'm going I'm to deal with this. He's willing to fight. And by the way, he doesn't fight from the perimeter where he can easily make a, run, a, a getaway. But he comes right in the middle of the field and stations himself there and draws his sword and begins to do battle. And I believe in one sense he says, listen... Satan, you cannot have what does not belong to you. What are you willing to fight for? Or how many things have you decided, well, what I'm going through is just life. How many believers just think that you have to tolerate every wicked thing that comes your way? The Bible does say praise the Lord in every circumstance, not praise the Lord for it, but in everything give thanks. Rejoice evermore, praying always, rejoicing always in the Lord. Why? Because praise and rejoicing in the midst of the battle opens the door for the Lord God to come in and work on your behalf. Amen. In the Isaiah says, your walls will be salvation, your gates will be praise. When you're hemmed in, the walls of salvation keep you safe. But when you praise, the doors open and Jesus comes in to be your victory. The one who fights for you. Too many times we're being bullied by the enemy. And Shama stands in the middle of the field where there's no chance for retreat. Oh, I tell you, church, the Christ we love and serve is worthy and worthy of our faithfulness in our battle. So think about this for a moment. The odds are against you. Will I take a stand anyhow? Will I suffer the rebuke of those who think I'm a religious nut? Will I stand and endure the persecution or criticism of those who think, and by the way, there's a lot of that going on right now. If, if a Christian takes a bold stance of faith in something, people will say, well, they're just stupid or they, you know, they're ignorant religious people that really don't know what the real battle is all about. But you're willing to say, I'll, I'll do battle against the odds. And how many times would you be willing to quit? Listen, I've been at places often in my ministry where I felt so discouraged because of lack of visible fruitfulness that I was ready to say, I'm done. Anybody ever been there in your life? Let me see hands. Yeah, I've had enough. I'm done. It's, I'm over it. <laughs> and I tried that. I mean, I tried that. I have a friend who told me one time after a divorce as a pastor, he said, I'm done. I'm never going to step back in again. And I prophesied over him and said, listen, you may try that one, but when God puts a call on your life, you are you're done. You can fight him as much as you want, but you'll find that the fighting God is a, is a losing battle. He didn't like me for that prophecy. <laughs> because years later, he became everything that God had prophesied over him, that he would be a leader of men, a builder of churches, and an apostolic type of ministry. You see, <clears throat> if we're willing to persevere... 
And what's the sword? What is the sword? What is this? Not this. This is valuable notes. This is the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God. The Bible says this is the sword that the Spirit wields. That's literally what it says in in Ephesians. The, the, The sword of the Spirit, and the translation is best, the sword which the Spirit wields. Now, I can handle this Bible pretty good, but the one who really makes the points get into the heart is the Holy Spirit who takes that word and divides between the flesh and the spirit. And he causes the transformation to happen. Sometimes, folks, the only thing you have is the promise that God said, but everything around you is, you, you feel like you're in the teeth of a thousand contradictions, but you hold on to the word of God. Yes. And someone says, listen, why don't you relax a little and just take a break and say the heck with it. You say, I would, but my hand is cramped around this word and I can't let go because God has shown me that this is the one thing I can stand on. Amen. Aren't you glad for the word of God? And you know, when you're dealing with something, someone, I think the enemy loves to just come and say, why, why, why are you fighting all this? Why, why, are you, why do you even give a rat uh, care? <laughs> Scratch that phrase. <laughs> Too many people have the interpretation. <laughs> Sorry, it was, it was them. Okay. <laughs> the enemy would like to taunt you and say, just, Listen, it's a small thing. Let it go. You know what the the deal is? It's the principle. It's the principle that the enemy says, I can do this because, after all, the problems in our world are greater than you can deal with. So just let it go. Listen, the one reason I will not let it go, the message of healing, is because, on principle, Jesus died for it. The reason I hold on to the concept of the power of the Holy Spirit is because Jesus died, rose, went to the Father's, right hand, and poured out a Holy Spirit anointing upon his church. That's something that I'm not going to give up. Though the enemy says, well, these days we don't need the gifts of the Spirit. We don't, know, we, we don't have to deal with demons anymore. After all, don't say demon in church. Folks, I'm telling you, every day I face people who are demonized. Every day. I've had people call me all kinds of nasty things. And... I look for my sword. (laughs) That's a joke. So we persevere in it all. We say, listen, enemy, you can't take what God has given me. It it may seem to you like a very little thing, but it's a big thing that God has trusted you and trusted you with. Last thing I want to say to you is how do you make the king's honor roll? How do you become one of these mighty men? How do you become mighty men of God and women of God, by the way? Women of God are mighty too. Ephesians 6 puts it very simply. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I can do nothing on my own. Folks, uh, when John Kilpatrick was leading the great revival in Pensacola, an evangelist named Mario Murillo went to his home and said to John Kilpatrick, the pastor of the Pensacola Assembly of God Church and said, John, how did this, how did this revival come about? And of course, he said, God, I want a revival. And he says, well, what, what did God tell you? When you said, God, I want a revival. The Lord gave some direction uh, that, that they were going to have to, some things they would need to do for it. But he said, this is what God said. I would just like to have my church back for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would just like to have exclusive rights to my church for a little bit. We often say, Lord, you can have your way. Come on in, take a seat in the back and behave. But Jesus doesn't take a back seat, neither does the Holy Spirit. He comes to the front. And you know, if we're going to have revival, it's going to come. But when we meet the requirements that he has for us, and that is to seek faithfully him and be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to say this. If you've not been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you are a believer, you're saved, you have the Spirit living within you. But if you've not been baptized with the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you to to seek the Lord for the mighty baptism of the Spirit. Because Jesus, who gave you his Holy Spirit inside, also said to his Spirit-filled 
those spirit believers that, that, he, that, that saw him after the resurrection, he said, now go wait in, in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Be empowered. You see, the Holy Spirit within you produces the fruit. The Holy Spirit upon you produces the signs, the wonders, and the power. How many want both? Folks, it's not either or. It's this and that. It's this thing that's dwelling in us, and it's that which comes upon us and gives us power and authority to preach the full gospel of Jesus. What is that? It's not some... Weird thing. Listen, I, I sometimes we we charismatics and Pentecostals do some of the weirdest stuff, and it causes people to wonder for crazy. And some of the stuff that happens is flesh. Some of it is definitely God. And it's sad to me that people would think that somehow God does weird stuff and He doesn't. We do the weird weird stuff. I've said that before. Y'all got it? Good. Okay. Hold fast to the Word of God. That sort of the spirit. And remember this. They overcame. You and I overcame by the blood of the lamb. And by the word of testimony. So this is the thing. In order to be used mightily of God. We must be totally surrendered to Christ. We used to word, use this phrase. To be totally sold out for God. I ask myself. Even at this point in my life. Have I really sold out completely for the Lord? Is there any part of me still. That wants to kind of maintain some level of control or some level of, you know, I've got this, but it has to come down to the, even in a service like this, if Jesus came in here today, and by the way, he would never barge in, he's here. But if the Holy Spirit came in and said, this is what I want to do. I want to mess up your whole plan. Before you leave, (laughs) before you leave today, the Holy Spirit wants to rattle us and shake us and do something mighty. How many of us say, even so, come Holy Spirit? Or how many of us would just kind of keep our eyes peeled for the weird one? I don't want to be next to that guy. (laughs) You can trust the Holy Spirit. You can trust the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Pastor, it's not him that I'm worried about. Yeah, I get that. I've been pastoring for 50 years. I know what you're talking about. But I would rather... Tame a wild stallion, then try to resurrect a dead horse. And God wants to set his people on fire. Total surrender. And remember this, you're never alone. If God be for us, who can be against us? Little things matter to the Lord. Recover everything that you may have left behind. Would you stand with me this morning? I hope I have conveyed the thoughts because I, I set aside one of the 10 best sermons ever so I could share this one because I'm telling you folks, I'm looking and God is looking for those through whom he can show himself strong. And God, as I said at the beginning, he's not looking for strong people. He's looking for surrendered people who he can make strong. I'm in for that. How about you? Help me. Just raise your hands with me if you would. Jesus, this is our cry. Father, help me, church. Father, just pray with me. Father, just we want you to send the Holy Ghost of fire. We want the wind of the Spirit to blow and fan the flames so that we can be on fire for you. And that, Lord, those that, that see us in everyday life will notice there's something different about these people. They love their King, Jesus, and they live it. And they operate in a sensitivity to the power of God and to the needs of those around them. And they're not afraid to say, can I pray for you? They're not afraid to witness of Jesus. Lord, that's, that's who we have to be in this hour. When the odds are against us, when we're weary and tired, when it's like it's not worth it, it is well worth it. And Jesus, we're saying, we're lining up in the dew of the morning, Lord. Lord, in the day that you raise up your army, we are willing. Someone say it with me. We are willing. Say it with me, will you? Jesus, we are willing to fight with you for the kingdom of God and for the sake of souls to be saved. And we do this all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thanks for being here. Please talk about the sermon today and find out if there's anybody agreed. We'll talk to you later. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it.